You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. As you may already know, wild boars can be a menace. They can also be a source of food, a delicacy even, in some European regions. And they can also be radioactive. Yes, indeed. More radioactive, in fact, than any other animals exposed to the same environment and for much longer. That anomaly makes those boars less a delicacy and, in fact, dangerous for humans to eat. But it does something else, too. It offers us a glimpse into the history of nuclear technology, from Cold War weapons to the future of energy. And it can teach us a few things about how we prepare for that future. This is the fascinating story of the wild boar paradox. I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Becky Ferreira is a science writer and a regular contributor to Motherboard. Hey, Becky. Hi, Jordan. Just so you can give people uh, the lay of the land, how common are uh, wild boars, that's what we're talking about today, in in Germany specifically, but also just, you know, that region, I guess, of Europe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're kind of overrunning Europe right now. There's at least a, a million or two in Germany specifically, and a couple million across um, that region of Europe. Their population kind of crashed with overhunting like everything else a century ago, but they have basically become very uh, populous as a re result of the story that we're going to talk about because their meat is not that safe to eat anymore, so there's not an incentive to hunt them, so they've kind of overrun the place. Why isn't their meat safe to eat? So they are very radioactive. <laughs> they are not safe to eat. Um, it's the kind of thing that people will tell you, like, if you had contaminated boar meat, like, once or twice, that's not a problem. You'll be fine. But to continually have it be a staple, as it has been in that part of the world for many, many centuries, um, is unfortunately not safe anymore because they have such high unsafe levels of cesium contamination. What is cesium contamination? First of all, what is it? And second of all, I guess, what's the risk in consuming it, as presumably these wild boars have, but also uh, that people may have in consuming them? Yeah, so it's it's a radioactive particle that has been uh, mostly linked to Ch the Chernobyl disaster in 1986. Um, it's one of the most pernicious particles uh, that has contaminated Europe from, from that disaster. It, it makes its way into boars and other animals through their food sources in the environment, and then, uh, of course, makes its way into us if we eat those game. The biggest risk for continually eating and, and exposing yourself to these meat sources and these food sources is higher risk of cancers and immune disorders and, and this constellation of diseases like that. And it's actually really not well understood as far as, as I understand it how it's affecting the animals themselves if they are getting higher incidence of, of cancers and things like that as well. Um, and that's one of the things I think was interesting about this study is just it really seems that this is an area of research that needs a lot of development. Before we get to the study itself, you mentioned Chernobyl. Is that what caused this? The assumption was that almost all of the radioactive contamination in Europe was from Chernobyl. And it was obviously really bad in the years following it, but because radioactive particles like cesium uh, have these half-lives, I, I believe cesium is about 30 years, which means, you know, half of it is decayed every 30 years. So it has gone down very significantly in the generations since Chernobyl uh, happened, but um, not in boars, which is very strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the assumption was that it was, it was, all this contamination that you see in Europe is is basically sourced to that. There were these atmospheric weapons tests, nuclear weapons tests before that, that maybe it had a trace element of, of uh, contamination, people thought. But that's really what this study was all about, was trying to kind of constrain which sources were which in terms of what's affecting these boars. How do we do that? And what did the study find? Yeah, so it's the the one of the authors on it, George Steinhauser, um, and his his co lead Bin Fang. He, I mean, George, it seems like he's been really obsessed with this question for a long time. It's it's known as the wild boar paradox because all these other game animals don't have the same amount of contamination as boars. Boars just continually seem to be defying this half life. Hmm. So they just wanted to see, you know, okay, so what's coming from these nuclear weapons tests? What's coming from Chernobyl itself? 
going in with the assumption again that it would be almost all Chernobyl. So um, with Chernobyl, there's like a very specific signature that is uh, an isotope of cesium called cesium-137. And then there's a lot of that also from the weapons test, but there's a specific ratio of another isotope, uh, cesium-135, that is, that that can be clearly is an origin in these in these weapons tests. So you can kind of parse it out that way. And I think this was the first study that had actually used like high resolution gamma ray detectors to really try to uh, constrain which sources were which. And what did they manage to figure out? Yeah, to their astonishment, they found that it was a huge amount of the weapons test radiation was still in present in this contamination. Some of these bores half of the contamination had the weapons test signature. Huh. And it varied from like sort of 10 to 66%, depending on where they were sampled in Bavaria. So I think it was it was a really huge shock because nobody had really considered that the weapons testing would still be around in that quantity. Right. And as you mentioned, why just bores? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's so fascinating. And for a long time, the hypothesis has been, and it seems to this is being borne out by this study and, and other studies, is that wild boars are very dependent on underground food sources in winter, especially like truffles, especially the deer truffle. And the way that cesium contamination kind of works is that it slowly kind of sinks into the soil over time. It reaches these these deer truffles, and it really accumulates in a large number there. So even if there's decaying half-lifes going on on the surface and in the, you know, inches under the soil surface, there is a kind of constant accumulation going on that kind of cancels out that half-life. Like these truffles just continually just keep the same amount of season contamination in them. So when the borers are especially, you know, they, they show a seasonal pattern with their contamination. And especially in winter, when they're completely almost reliant on these food sources, huh. they are uptaking that way more than the other animals who are, you know, eating barks and grasses that are, are now largely not very contaminated. Do people eat these truffles too? If there's one uh, assumption that I as a Canadian have about Europeans is that they love to go truffle hunting. <laughs> this is likewise, likewise. Um, yeah, no, the people people do. The actual truffle that um, appears to be the biggest culprit here is unique to to boars. They, people, it's not the same species that people eat. Okay, but I think that's a question that they're going to start to pursue now in the future. Is just how contaminated are the sources of of human truffles, and if there could be a risk there. I think because truffles are so are kind of like the delicacy, it, you might not be exposed to it as much as you would with another food, but. Right. One of the next steps that the authors told me they were going to go into now was just like to look at these truffles and try to um, really specifically link this contamination with with the content of these truffles and, and try to see what the implications are for humans. You mentioned that the radio cesium in these truffles seems to be replenished. Do we know like how that's happening and if this is a cycle that will perpetuate endlessly or is it, you know, gradually coming down over the past 60 years? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like that's actually something they don't really know yet. Right now, there's like a constant flow of the cesium into these truffles. They're, they're not like increasing in cesium or decreasing in cesium. They're just staying constant. So eventually, as the cesium does start to finally leach out of the soil this way, like these truffles might see a decrease. Uh, but that could be decades or centuries. No, Nobody knows because it's just a lot is not known about the interactions of the cesium with the soil. Hmm. And one of the things the authors mentioned is that they, they don't really know how the Chernobyl fallout is interacting with the tests fallout. Huh. So it's possible that there is some kind of interaction going on there that that's keeping the contamination strong, which also might explain the persistence of the contamination in the bores. What do these findings say in the larger picture about the fallout from these kind of tests? Does it have broader implications for, for other kinds of food supply or what? Yeah, I think they are really surprised by just how pernicious this weapons testing contamination is. This is a kind of a global contamination because these weapons tests were a lot of them were done in the atmosphere, so the particles kind of went everywhere. And it's just particularly pronounced because you have the, the two sources in Europe with both Chernobyl and this. So it's like there is a smattering of this radioactive uh, debris everywhere, but it's just not in, in a high concentration everywhere. Right. Fukushima has very similar stuff, and actually they also have a wild boar 
radioactive problem as well. So, hmm. it, you know, it, it was true even as these weapons tests were being conducted in the 60s, you know, 40s through the 60s, that they people constantly underestimated the contamination that was going to result from these tests. And it just continues to be a really surprising and underappreciated source of worldwide contamination. I just think that scientists now are kind of grappling with the fact that it is so long lived and the, and the effects in, in terms of your question about the effects on food safety and things like that. I really think they are not sure the full extent of this kind of thing. And I think um, for the most part, they would say that ecosystems are largely safe because the half-life has decreased so much of the arable kind of soils. Hmm. But it's worrying when you have something that is so little understood that that could potentially have such big consequences. You mentioned uh, Fukushima has this problem as well. Mm -hmm. What about elsewhere in the world? Uh, Europe was not, I don't think, the only place where these kind of tests were conducted. To my knowledge, most of these tests in terms of the atmospheric tests were sort of remote areas of the oceans. You had the Marshall Islands is a very famous story, which is right. a, a great example of completely unexpected prevalence of, of radiation there. That is a unfortunately very contaminated area because of those tests and and unintended con- consequences from those tests and there were also large tests in in Russia or the, when it was the Soviet Union and there are of course modern tests with North Korea and China had one a couple decades ago i believe as well so hmm. and, and india has also conducted atmospheric tests so many countries have have conducted them but you know when it comes to like tests like from France and the UK that they conducted they didn't actually do it close to europe so a lot of this is like kind of like scattered places that are considered remote, but that have also been greatly affected. Finally, I guess, what does this tell us about the future of nuclear in general? If we're still learning just how long this stuff can last, how far it can spread or, or whatever, you know, does this just apply to nuclear weapons or does this also have implications for uh, nuclear power, which I know a lot of nations are are looking to, to, to supply clean energy. Yeah. So Dr. Steinhauser really emphasized that this is a cautionary tale kind of a study. I mean, this just really shows you how incredibly unexpected the cascade effects of a nuclear accident can be. And obviously nuclear power is a amazing alternative to fossil fuels. I think most people see it as part of the decarbonization future. You want to be able to to mitigate as many risks as possible, especially given the enormous impact of Chernobyl and Fukushima, those two disasters on their their environments and even far-flung kind of impacts like thousands of miles away. Both of those accidents have been extremely dangerous. So in terms of nuclear power, I, I think it's the study is not, and then the authors were not necessarily saying, okay, this is not something we should pursue, but it should be pursued with the utmost care. Right. They mentioned explicitly the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the kind of nuclear saber, saber rattling that's been going on there with, you know, Putin saying that nuclear weapons are not off the table. Mm-hmm. And of course, I mentioned North Korea as well doing weapons tests. So it's like this kind of simmering specter of renewed nuclear weapons testing and even detonations in a war setting Great. is extremely scary. Yeah. I mean, not of course for anyone who was actually in the fallout of those immediately, but also because, yeah, they, they, they're they saying they don't really understand how these different sources of radiation are interacting with each other in the environment. So if you add a new overlay, it's not only upping the the concentrations of these particles, but it's also like a kind of wild card. Like, how are the new weapons tests going to interact with the old weapon tests and the Chernobyl stuff? You know, it's it's a it's just a huge disaster. And I think you know we do we do think about nuclear weapons as as this ultimate awful destructive force and these terrible you know consequences that they immediately have. But I think this was a really a study that highlights that that the damage is something that our great-great-great-grandchildren will still be experiencing, right? And I think those are really important consequences to be emphasizing. Becky, thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Becky Ferreira writing for Motherboard. That was the big story. For more, including actually no other stories quite like this one, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you'd like to help us out, On this show, as we prepare for a brand new little project, you could share with us your questions, comments, or concerns as they relate to today's economy. Are you struggling with something? Are you trying to figure out how something works? Are you wondering why nothing works the way it used to? 
Any questions you have, any experiences you've got, we'd love to hear about them. We may reach back out to you, so please leave us a way to contact you. And yeah, just uh, tell us your money stories, and we'll see if we can help you out. You can do that by finding us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN. You can also email us hello at the Big Story Podcast.ca. And you can call us and leave us a voicemail, 416 935 5935. Joe Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is a producer. Ryan Clark is a sound designer, along with many others who step in here and there. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Diana Kay is our business manager. I am our executive producer and your host, Jordan Heath Rawlings. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk Monday.